There we go. All righty. Well, before we get started today, I, I just wanted to, to uh, share a few things. I wanted to, to share the announcements, and then we'll get going here in the message. But um, first of all, if you take out your bulletins, and when you do, lots of good information in here about things that are happening today. But we want to encourage you to pull out your communication sheet. And at some time during the service today, if you would fill that out, that helps us when we're praying. It helps us to know what needs that, that you do have out there and that we can come alongside uh, you with. Also uh, in there are your sermon notes. And so we encourage you as well if you would pull out your sermon notes and then you can take notes as uh, we're going on with the message here today. Uh, when you're done with the communication sheets at the end of the service, if you just put them in one of the offering boxes by the back door, it would be great. We've got a couple of activities that are coming up here in the, the really near future. How many of you are ladies here? Quite a few ladies. In fact, we've probably got more ladies than men out here, don't we? This Friday night at 6.30, uh, we are going to be hosting at our house. I'll be gone. I'm going to go do something. But uh, we're hosting at our house. Cheryl is hosting uh, a ladies' night out. So if you, got, if you ladies want to get together for a lot of fun, it will be at our house. Uh, we've got the information in the bulletin where you can see that as well. Also, for those of you who didn't get your directories and you ordered them, we've got them up front here today. And we just ask that after the service that you would come up and just sign out that you did pick up your directory. We had orders for them. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get one to everybody. It's been a while since we've done a baptismal service. And uh, we've got uh, a young lady who's going to be baptized this coming Thursday night. We're going to use the baptism tank at, at Madison Street Community Church. And if there's anyone else here who's never been baptized but who would like to follow the Lord in baptism, this may be the opportunity for you. So if you're interested in doing that if, on your communication sheet, if you could just write down baptism, or if you're interested in going and seeing the baptism service over at Madison Thursday night, uh, right across the street from Sunset Middle School, it will be right at uh, uh, around about 6.30 we'll, we'll be doing that. And the last thing that I was asked to announce as I came in here today was that uh, we are preparing to do a children's musical, at least a couple of songs, the Sunday before Christmas. And we need some kids. And so if you've got children that like to sing and that they would like to be a part of uh, the, the Christmas music that's going to be coming up, if they could come early or you could bring them early, they can't drive, but <laughs> if, if you could bring them early and uh, be here at 9 o'clock in, in Sunday mornings and we'll be right over here in the children's Sunday school uh, room practicing. And so the Sunday before Christmas, uh, we'll have that time. Would you please stand for a moment in honor of reading God's word? James chapter 1, beginning with verse 9, says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it withers and the grass, it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for he has, has been approved, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning of his own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word. And you promise, Lord, that your word will not return void. And I pray that today as we look at a topic that's going to be very applicable to each and every person who's here, that of temptation. Lord, I, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would help us in those areas of weakness. And I pray, Lord, for those of us who are struggling in an area where we haven't been able to get a grasp on it, that today through your word this will help. And so we just dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I absolutely love the Word of God. I mean, it's, it's amazing as we spend time in it, and I hope you're spending time in your Word every day in, the, in that quiet time because that's when God speaks to you. That's when 
you see these incredible truths that are in the word and, and all of a sudden they'll start applying to our lives and we can see how we can handle them. But it's got so many areas within the word that are so applicable to our lives. I mean, we think this is an old book. People say this book's been on the shelf for years. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years. Yes, but it's living and it's active and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. And it applies to your everyday life in ways that you may not even begin to imagine. And so I hope you're taking the time to read that. But one of the things that I found out, especially in this book of James, which is so practical in helping us with our everyday lives, is that it just jumps right out, right out at you. And in, in the sections of scripture that we've had from last week, last week we looked at nobody is immune to trials. Everybody is going to have to go through trials in our lives. And sometimes God puts those trials into our lives to develop us as Christians, to develop us to the fullness of Christian maturity. They're there for a purpose. It's like the athlete, the weightlifter, who's constantly lifting those weights, trying to build up those muscles. And why is he doing it? Because he's developing the strength and no pain, no gain. Sometimes, even in our Christian lives, we have to go through pain to gain, to get to where God would have us to be. And as we do, we are a new person. I mean, God begins to develop. And, and as you, you look back on your own life, if you look back over the history of your life and the things that you've gone through, you are today because of the experiences that you've been through. You are today the person you are because of the way that you handle those experiences. And we're promised in God's word that, that if, if we walk according to his word, we will be blessed. But if we fight God's word, we will be cursed. And we're going to be wondering, why are we going through all of these things? And quite often, it's because we're going contrary to God's word. Well, there's two facts that we learn in the book of James. One of them is that each and every one of us face trials within our lives. Those trials may have to do with our work relationships. It may have to do with relationships that we have at home. It may have to do with, with health problems that we're going through. But none of us are immune to trials in our lives. It's how you handle those trials that counts. I've been reading a book by, by Charles Stanley called Temptations. And Stanley writes, he said, a wise individual prepares for those things that are inevitable in life. Temptation is one of those inevitable things. A plaque that I saw not long ago summed it up this way. Opportunity only knocks once. Temptation leans on the doorbell. Isn't that true? I mean, you get that opportunity one time, temptation's there every day. Temptation's pushing at you all the time. But the question is, is how are you going to end up responding to that temptation? Well, verse 9 starts off and it says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. That word on here, let the lowly brother, and what this means is let the poor brother, let the poor brother who's going through difficult times, let him glory in the exaltation of his position. And you say, what do you mean? And what does glory mean? In this particular context, what glory means is to boast. If you're going to boast about anything, boast about God. Boast about what he's doing in your life. And if you're struggling right now financially, you're going to find that maybe it's causing you to turn to God for help. Have you ever noticed that it seems like a lot more poor people seem to become Christians than a lot more rich people? And quite often, people who are, are, are wealthy, and, and not all the time, but quite often, people who are wealthy become dependent upon the money that they have. They become dependent upon their status. And, and they, why would they need God? But when you're broken, when, when you're out of money, when you're having health problems, you don't have a whole lot of opportunity to do anything but to turn to God. And, and the Bible here says, James says, let yourself exalt uh, in, in or glory in, in your lowly position. It's interesting that rich nor poor, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You know, the poor person can exalt in his low position, maybe in poverty, but especially in the sense of his high position in Christ. Do you realize that when you are a Christian, that you are a child of the king, and that all of the promises of the cross, all of the promises of Christ, all of the promises of scripture belong to you. You can, you can exalt in that. You can glory in that. But the glory goes to God for what he's doing. But on the other hand, you've got the rich person as well. And it says, verse 10, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower in the field, he will fade. 
you know, the, the rich can glory in the fact that uh, they need to be humble. And at times, maybe when he does become humble and things get bad with the stock market, whatever it is, that they end up turning to, to God. And, and they can glory or boast in that, that God is there during those times. Have you ever noticed how quick life goes by? I mean, it's absolutely amazing to me. I remember when I was before 21 years old, maybe some of you young people can remember, and it's like, I wish my 21st birthday would come. My time is going so slow, and it never moves. And you finally hit that 21st birthday, right? And then what happens? Man, life's going like crazy from that on, and the older you get, the faster it ends up going. But it doesn't matter whether you're incredibly wealthy. It doesn't matter whether you're poor. That time is still going to pass. I mean, each and every person, poor or rich, is, is, is all going to have a relatively short lifespan. I mean, generally 70 years old, mid-70s, I think, is the average somewhere in that area. But we've got, all got a relatively short lifespan. On the other hand, all of us are going to have to stand before God. Our money can't save us. It's amazing that uh, all the things that are happening with Apple computers right now and, and uh, the story of Steve Jobs and how it all came back. Apple had gone down for a while and then they ended up uh, coming back up. And, and do you realize that Apple computers has more money in the bank than the American government today? Do you realize that? Apple computers, but Steve Jobs, as wealthy as he was, as wise as he was when it came to business, couldn't fight that pancreatic cancer. And when that cancer came on him, he fought it for a while. He fought it for longer than a lot of people do. But at the same time, that pancreatic cancer ended up getting them. They've got a bankroll bigger than the United States government. And yet when that time came for Steve Jobs, he went into death, just like you or me are going to go into death if the Lord doesn't end up returning again. Wealthy people and poor people alike need to realize that our Savior is God and that we need God. We may th fool ourselves and think that for now uh, we've got the things that we need, but can you imagine the difference that it would be if everybody, poor or rich, lived their lives in the light of eternity? I think we get to the point where we think, huh, we're going to live forever. You know, death is never going to come to me. I remember when I was young, I used to think that, man, you know, that's, that's for other people, right? It's for all of us. <laughs> but can you imagine that if we lived our lives in the light of eternity, do you think it would change the way that we live? If you lived your life like you may not be here next week, would you live in a different way? If you thought you only had six months left with your children, how would you respond with your children? How would you respond with your wife? Would you just put them on the side as we're going and we're doing our business and we're doing everything else? Or would you pay a little bit more attention to them? Would you desire to be with them more? How would your life change if you lived in the light of eternity? And I think that's what the Bible calls us to do, is we are to live in the light of eternity. Life on this earth is really short. It is passing by incredibly quickly. And it says, as the flower fades in the field, he's going to pass away. We're going to pass away. How are we going to live our lives? And what kind of a legacy are we going to leave behind for those people that we've touched? Is it going to be a legacy that we did our own thing? I, I remember the, the, the bumper sticker that used to be on the back of motorhomes you'd see all over the place, and you'd have the retired people, and they'd put it on there, and it said, he who has the most toys, what is it? Wins. You've seen it too. He who has the most toys wins. But I'll tell you what, when we come to the point in our life where it's time to go home, all of that stuff's staying behind, and it doesn't matter. What matters is what you did with Jesus Christ. What matters is your personal relationship with him because we all, rich or poor, will stand before the judgment seat of God. Well, verse 12 goes on. In fact, verse 11, I'll read on. It says, for, for no, no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than, than it withers the grass, its flowers fall, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich will also fade away from their pursuits. Verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know, let me read it this way. Blessed is the man who endures. Blessed is the man who suffers through temptation. Do you notice it doesn't say, blessed is the man if he suffers through temptation. It doesn't say that, doesn't it? It says, blessed is the man who, each and every one of us, have to fight temptations in our life. 
Those temptations will come. Maybe people do different things than others, but maybe you fight gossiping. Maybe you fight slander or, or attitudes or whatever it might be, uh, different things that will become it, but the temptations will, will be there to do what's wrong. But the Bible says that blessed is the man or the person who endures, who stands firm, even during those temptations. It says, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to who? Did you see in verse 12? Which the Lord has promised to those who love him. It's interesting that uh, in the ancient games, there used to be a, a victor's wreath that, 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 that they would wear. And in fact, uh, they had the Olympic Games and, and uh, the Ithmian Games, and they, they would have a judgment seat there, which was called the Bema Judgment. By the way, the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is what? It's the Bema seat, and that's the imagery that's there. And for the person who followed the rules, the person who went ahead and they won that particular athletic event, as they did, they would get a wreath. Now, it wasn't a golden wreath like that, but it was a, it was a plant that they would go ahead and they would put on their head, uh, a laurel or something that they would put up there, and they would get that wreath. And that's the comparison, the analogy that's going on here is that when we go through, that, through, the, through the, the, the lifetime that we're going through and all of the trials, all of the temptations, when we get to the end, if we endure those temptations, if we love our God, then we will be awarded a crown of life. Now the question is, is what is that crown of life? Now, I mean, we get the imagery of the crown and you wear it on that you have won. But that crown of life, I believe, is the crown of eternal life. That when we love God, when we have spent our life serving him as best we can by grace through faith in Christ, that we will get that crown of eternal life. And that's the reward that we get at the end. I think it's critical as we look at this passage here that you see in the bottom of that, it says the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. If I were to ask you, and I want you to be genuine here, I want you to think in your, in your own head. If I were to ask you here on a scale of one to 10, how much do you love God? What would it really be? Do you love God as uh, we find, in fact, in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 22, we find Jesus answering a, a lawyer, a lawyer had heard him, and he decided that he was going to trap Jesus, and at, I think at one point they were trying to, trying to catch him on something, but the lawyer asked Jesus a question to test him, and he said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment? Do you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, to love, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. <laughs> Martin Luther used to go nuts on this particular verse. He, he would go uh, and pray by the hour. He would go into the confessional every morning when he was uh, in the monasteries, and the father confessor used to get nuts at him because he'd go in sometimes two and three hours and the rumors began to circulate around the monastery that, uh, that Luther was just killing time. He's in there just killing time. He's lazy. He doesn't want to go to work. But he would go in there, and what happened is Martin Luther had a real sense of the holiness of God in his own sin sinfulness. And what came to mind on Luther was this. If the, if the, the, great, if the greatest law, what's the greatest law? If the greatest law is to love the Lord, or greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and all of your mind, all of your strength, then what is the greatest transgression? The great commandment is to love. And if it's to love, then what's the great transgression? Not to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. How do you love God today? Scale of 1 to 10, how do you love them? Honestly, what are some things that you as a Christian can do to develop that love? What are some things that you can do to develop that relationship? Spend time in God's word, spend time with other believers, spend time in prayer, spend time with him. I think we get so busy today that our mind is on everything else. We're playing church, we're doing this and everything else. We need to have our minds on God. He's who we're here to worship. It's God. You know, it's not the worship team, it's not the preacher or anything, it's God's word as it comes. We're talking about God, and he's here, and he's watching. You say, how can God be here and, and watching? Because he's omnipresent. That means he is everywhere at one time, and God is here, and it's to him 
who we worship. How do you love God? And do you love God? Verse 13 it goes on, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. You know, so often people begin to point the finger at God, but what we find out in the Bible here is that God doesn't tempt anywhere, anyone. And we're just too quick to point the finger, God, why did you make me this way? And whenever we point the finger, how many fingers do we have pointing back? We've got three pointing back at us, and it goes back to the point, well, wait a minute. Rather than casting blame as we do so often, we need to be willing to take that blame even upon ourselves. Think of Satan in the Garden of Eden as, as Eve was in there. And, and you remember after the creation of man, God said, look, you can eat, Adam, of any tree in this garden except for the tree in the middle. Do not eat from the, the tree of the knowledge and good, of good and evil, for on the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, did Adam and Eve die physically immediately? No, it came later. Did they die spiritually immediately? Yes, at, at that moment. Whenever sin is involved, death is quick to come behind. But in Genesis chapter 3, Satan comes to Eve in the garden, and he begins to, to tempt her. He begins to tempt her to begin to doubt God. Did God really say that you shouldn't eat from, from any other tree and that the day that you eat of it, you will surely die? Did he really say it? Don't you realize <clears throat> that if you do, that, that you are going to know the difference between good and evil? Don't you realize that if you eat of this, free, of this fruit, that you will be like God? And you see, immediately... The deceiver here, Satan, begins to work his way in, and he begins to challenge Eve to the point where she begins to, to question some of these things, and how do I know that? Because she took the fruit and she ate it, even though the, she knew that she shouldn't have done that. And when she did, instantly her eyes were open, and she goes over to Adam, and she says, Adam, you got to try some of this fruit. It's delicious. When you do, your mind's going to be open. You're going to know all of these things. And Adam said, Eve, what are you doing? Don't you realize that God said that the moment that you eat of this tree, you surely die? Is that what Adam did? No, he didn't, did he? In fact, what Adam did is, let me have the fruit. Man, that, that's pretty neat. I want to see too. And he begins to eat. And immediately, he died spiritually. Now, that's critical because Adam was representative of you and me in the garden. And the moment he fell, we fell with him. But you see, God never tempts but he does test. Satan came in to, to tempt, to destroy. God came in to test Adam, and in so doing that, Adam fell and mankind fell. And you know the whole story in which it sets up for the need for Jesus Christ and redemption uh, and all of that to restore us once again. So Charles Stanley, <clears throat> in his book Temptations, writes, it doesn't matter if you have a problem with gossip, jealousy, anger, gambling, lusting, or uh, lion or lust, it's really all the same pattern. Satan hasn't changed his strategy since he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. It said he has no need to. If it worked on two perfect people in a perfect environment with perfect relationship with God, think how much more effective it will be on us, especially if we are unaware of what is going on and have made no provision to stop him. Adam was tested in the perfect environment, in the perfect setting. You think about Adam, he was in the Garden of Eden. It was beautiful, all the food that he can eat. And then he had Eve who was there for his companionship. And he was walking with God there in the garden, that God was there with him. He had everything that he needed in that garden. And yet contrast what happened to Jesus. Jesus, as soon as uh, the Holy Spirit comes upon him, is taken out into the desert in order to be tested. Now, that testing, because Jesus came as the second Adam, or as the last Adam, where Adam fell, Jesus came to be the Savior. Where Adam had everything, Jesus had nothing. He had no companionship. He was out in the desert. There was no food that was going on. He was at his very weakness, or weakest, but watch how he responds here. So God tested Jesus in the wilderness, but the temptations came from Satan. Test number one, devil, the devil came up and he said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus has gone 40 days without eating. He was hungry. There was stones in front. Turn them into bread. Are you hungry? And Jesus responded and he said, 
uh, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then test number two ended up coming. And the devil took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple, to the highest place in the temple, and he said, if you are the son of God, once again, there's that if word in there, is if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. How did Jesus handle it that time? Matthew chapter 4, verse 7. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And you notice on each of these, and it's critical, because in each case, Jesus quotes a verse from the book of Deuteronomy. That's important that you remember that. Test number three, so that didn't work, and so the devil takes Jesus up on the top of a high mountain and he shows him all of the kingdoms of the world out there, and he said, all of these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus answered to him, and he said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only are you to serve. You know, you look at Jesus here, and I think it's so critical that, that we can learn a few things for our own lives and that's that in, in the weakness of his humanity, in the weakness of his human flesh, after 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, fasting and not eating, going through the exact opposite of, of what Adam went through, Jesus succeeded where Adam failed. Well, there's a couple of points we can pick up. Number one is that we need to know our Bible. Each time Jesus quoted a scripture from the book of Deuteronomy to refute the devil, when the devil came at him to tempt him. Secondly, Jesus quoted those verses. You know, I think today a lost art is memorization of the Bible. In, in the old days, we used to do a lot. We do some in, in Awana, but today we're so busy, we just kind of put it on the side. I'll tell you, when you read the stories about Christians in the past who have gone into prison and, and for, for their faith, and just to get a page of scripture, what would they do with that page? They would memorize it. And then different people would get different pages and they would memorize it so that when they took those away, they could come together and they could still recite the word of God. It's so precious to get the Bible within our minds so that when those temptations come, when those times of discouragement come, that we are ready and we can say those verses. And the last thing is to choose to obey God. Jesus chose to, to, to refute the enemy using scripture and he chose to obey God even in the most difficult of circumstances, and each and every one of us can learn from that. Do you realize that Satan, he knows Scripture, but do you realize that Satan hates Scripture? In fact, when Satan uses Scripture, we'll find that he twists it, he changes it just a little bit, and, and uh, he hates Scripture. When my daughter Jessie was really young, she used to be afraid at night to go into her room, and uh, so we would turn on K-Light Radio in there, and as we did, it would, what would happen is she'd just sleep all night long with Christian music playing in the background and it brought this tremendous peace to her. I've had occasion over the years here where I've been invited by people to come in. They're, they're concerned about their house. They feel like there's evil spirits that are in their house. There's things that just aren't going right in there. There's something wrong. And in those particular times, we come in and we do scripture, we do, do prayer. But then you know what I tell them to do? Put on Christian music. Because if Satan hates scripture, if Satan hates worship music, Christian worship music, how do his demons react? You drive them nuts. And so, you know, I mean, if you, if you go through a situation where you feel, man, things are not right, you know, there's just something not right in, in this house, you know, do the, do the praying and everything, but turn on that Christian music and just let it run. And I'll tell you what, if they are a demon, if there's a demon in that house, they are not going to be around, uh, want to be around Christian worship music. That's the last thing that they would want to hear. Well, a major question here comes up about Satan. Did God create him evil? And I have to say, absolutely not. Adam and Eve were created perfect, but they were created as mutable beings. What mutable means is, is that they change. So God created them without sin. He created them in perfection, but he created them mutable so that there was no sin in there, but that they could change, and with the circumstances, they did. And people say, well, how about Satan? How about the, the demons out there? Did, did God create evil? He created them. Did, did he create evil? It's, it's the same thing. 
God created them perfectly, but he created them mutable. That means the ability to change, the ability to, to do what's right, or the ability to do what's wrong. As we look in, in the book of Isaiah, what we find out is, is Satan was up in the highest place. In fact, he was a, a guardian cherub, an, an anointed cherub. And his problem was his pride. He said, I will exalt my throne above the angels or above the stars. I will be like the Most High. Remember back when he was talking to Eve and he said, you will be like the Most High and you will be like God? He said, I will be like the Most High. Ezekiel talks a little bit about it in Ezekiel 28, verse 14. He said, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in all of your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. Do you see what happened there? God created him perfect, but he created him mutable. He created him with the ability to change. He created him with a free choice. He created him with the ability to decide to disobey God, which is exactly what ended up happening. Well, verse 14 goes on and it says here, it says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and he's enticed. When I was young, uh, I used to love to go fishing. Uh, we had a cabin up in the, the um, foothills of California on the Stanislaus River. We had a whole half of the river to ourselves. And I used to go up there, and, and I'd get ready. I had my Eagle Claw pole, my Mitchell 308 reel, and a and, uh, little tiny size 12 hook, and would get on the white water on the river. And you could pretty much tell where the trout would be. And I'd get my salmon eggs on there, and I'd look, and I'd cast out there and let the water or the, the bait run in by the rocks. And every now and then you see a trout dart out and take a look at it. And every now and then there'd be a really nice one that would come in. But I, but I, I learned that you can entice them. You get it out in front of the, their nose, you work it right by them, and you let them relax. And before you know it, boom, they would take it. Occasionally there was a big one. And I'd say, oh, man, i got to get that. So I would get the plumpest salmon eggs that I could find. And there's a little tiny size 12 hook, and I would put three of those big salmon eggs on there, and I would put that thing right in front of their nose until finally, Cheryl used to say, Mike, Mike just teases them. He teases them. And that's what I'd do. I'd put them right in front of their, their nose, and I'd keep them looking at that thing until finally they came out, and they took it, and boom, I had it. And I had dinner. Do you realize that's what Satan does to us as Christians? He takes whatever that temptation is for us, whatever that desire is, and he makes it look so plump. He makes it look so beautiful, and he puts that out in front of us, and it, it may be that pornography on the computer that you're looking at, and he gets it there to where you're looking at it. It's right in front of your nose constantly, and if you don't deal with it, all of a sudden you take the bait and boom, you're his dinner. Or it may be that, that improper relationship that, that you're in, maybe at work, maybe you're getting too close to somebody at your job, maybe you're getting too close to somebody else, and you know that that's not honoring to God, but he's got it right in front of your face, and he's going to keep on going until finally you go out and boom, he's got you, and Satan will take you for dinner. It may be gambling. Years ago, and the people aren't in the community now, but I had a young man come into my office he said, I'm having marriage problems, and I, I, I need some help, I need some counseling on this, and as I talked to him, the longer I talked, I found out what was causing his marriage problems. He had been going to the mill, and he was $40,000 in debt. He had a gambling problem. And, you know, they got credit cards now where you go in there and you just put the credit card in, and they, the, 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 they'll just keep running it up. And he thought, well, if I just keep playing, I'm going to win. I'm going to get that money back. I'm not going to have problems. Now he's got real money. That was Satan out there, just right in front of his nose, that weakness, and boom. He ended up getting him. Well, Jesus tells us that we need to cut off whatever is causing us to sin. And he uses hyperbolic language here. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose part of your body than it is to lose your whole body and to be thrown into hell. And you say, wow, that's pretty radical, Jesus. And it is. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 30, he says, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than it is for your whole body to go into hell. You think, wow, Jesus, are you telling me that if I'm having problems in a particular area and if I have trouble looking at girls or I have trouble looking at guys, I should take a knife and gouge out my eye? No, that's not what he's saying. 
He's speaking in hyperbolic language, stretching it out to make a point so that we could understand. Take that hand that's getting you into trouble and cut it off. Is that what he's telling you to do? Not, it's hyperbolic language. What he is telling you to do is whatever that temptation is, whatever that sin is, cut it off. If you're struggling with pornography, and I've got to tell you, over 50% of Christian men struggle with pornography. If you're struggling in that area, there is one solution. You're not going to beat it by having it in front of your face. You've got to cut it off. You've got to get away from that. If you're in that improper relationship with somebody at work or church or wherever it might be, cut it off. Don't let the enemy get a hold of you because he's got one intent. And that one intent is to destroy you. That's why he's here. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.22, and he said, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You see, if you let Satan lead you into the lion's den, you're probably going to end up being bit. And the best thing to do rather than walking into that lion's den is just cut it off. Do you realize... You know, I mean, we, we all fall into sin. When we do, we're to confess our sin. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. Cleanse us all unru- of all unrighteousness. But I'll tell you, if we would stop and count the cost before we do, if we would see the way that our lives are going to be affected and they're going to be destroyed and the people who are going to be hurt, maybe we wouldn't be so inclined to do the things that we do. Satan doesn't come, you realize, as a little fat man in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork. Do you know where that came from? That came from the Middle Ages because they thought that if they mocked him that he would go away. But when Satan comes, my Bible says that he comes as an angel of light. In fact, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then that his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will will be what their actions deserve. You know, Satan doesn't come in his ugliness. He doesn't come revealing the harm he's going to do to you. He comes in something that is pretty enticing to you, something that's pretty attractive to you and is really easy to fall into. In fact, it looks good, at least temporarily, and somehow he, he gets you to forget the consequences that you're going to be facing. But that's how Satan oper- operates. He entices us by dangling the bait in front of our noses, and then we get nailed. In fact, if you think about a thin, sinful thought long enough, you're probably going to end up doing that. We see that with David, don't we? David should have been out at the time of war with the kings, but instead he's up on his balcony. He looks down, he sees a beautiful young lady, married young lady, down below. Who's that? Oh, that's Bathsheba. Whose husband is it? Or whose wife is it? Uriah the Hittite. And David says, get her for me. You know, and all of the problems that ended up going to David... But he did, and he stayed where he shouldn't have done. He kept with that bait right in front of his nose, and he got snagged and ended up having to face the consequences of it. When tempted, it's important to realize that we don't have to sin. In fact, it's a choice. Jonathan Edwards in Edwards Law said, we'll always follow our greatest inclination at the moment of decision. Not only will we, but we must. So what does that mean? Think about it. We'll always follow our greatest inclination at the moment of decision. In other words, if I want to sin at that moment more than I want to obey God, what am I going to do 100 times out of 100 times? I'm going to sin. But if I want to obey God more than I want to sin, what am I going to do 100 times out of 100 times? I'm going to obey God. So as Christians, it's critical for us to get our desires so that our desires are on God, our desires are on pleasing God, because whichever we want to do the most, we have a choice here, is what we're going to do. And if we mess up, confess it. If we mess up, ask God for his forgiveness. In fact, it's interesting that, um, that it says here, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Whoops, wrong passage there. I'm missing one there. Anyways, it says that uh, no temptation has, has overtaken us except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what you are able But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Do you realize that sometimes we feel like we're in this on our own? I just, I I don't know why these temptations always end up hitting me. But no temptation has overtaken you. Did you hear what it said? Except such as is common to man. We're all in this together, folks. It's how we deal with those temptations that matter. And Jesus showed us a little earlier on. 
Some people feel like they've sinned even because they've been tempted. Let me ask you this. Is it a temptation to be sin? Or a sin? Is it a temptation? Is it a sin? <laughs> I'll get it right here. Is it a sin to be tempted? No. You know why I can say that with absolute surety? Because Jesus himself was tempted. If it was a sin to be tempted, then Jesus himself would have sinned. The Bible says on four different occasions that Jesus was without sin. The temptation is a thought. The temptation it could, be, could be a hunger. It could be something that's coming at you. But, but it's not a sin until we get to the point in which we begin to dwell on it and we begin to lust for it. Verse 15, Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death, brings forth death. Three steps to personal destruction. Number one, evil desire. Number two, sin. And number three, death. You know, what kind of sins are you struggling with today? Because none of us are immune to it. I think it's so critical. As Christians, we tend to be really judgmental. We tend to look and, and, and say, oh, we've got huge sins over here. We've got the sin of homosexuality. That's like out of the league. And then over here, we've got uh, adultery, which is not as bad as that one, but it's, it's bad. Oh, and then we've got gossip. Oh, and then we've got slander. Do you see what we do? You know what the Bible says? For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at how many points? One point is guilty of all. So homosexuality, gossip, a sin is a sin. And we need to realize that sins are sins, and we need to stop being judgmental. We need to begin looking at ourselves and seeing the areas in our lives that we need to turn around and pray to the Lord to, to convict other people in the areas that they're struggling with. But the critical point here in verse 15 is that the final result, when sin grows unchecked to the fullness of maturity, is death. Death always follows sin. Death could be death of a marriage. It could be death of a family. It could be death of a particular relationship. It could be physical death. We see that in the Bible. Or it could ultimately be spiritual death. But the good news is, uh, in fact, the good news and the bad news is found in, in Romans 6.23, and that's for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, our Lord. That when we all struggle in these areas, there is forgiveness available. There is help available, but that help ends up coming in Christ, and it comes with the gospel message. When I was living in Fremont years ago, uh, I went into the, the lobby of our church, and when I did, I pulled out this gospel track, and I started looking through the gospel track, and I, I was stunned. Everywhere in the gospel where the word sin should have been, it had been changed to mistake. I thought, what? There's a little bit of a difference there. Every word the sin should have been there, it had been changed to a mistake. Now, a sin is a violation not only against the person that you sin against, but the sin is a violation against a holy God. A mistake is something that we did by accident. Now, maybe some sins came from accident, but a sin is a sin. And it's absolutely critical that we give the gospel message. As we look back over history, we find that the greatest revivals have occurred when the word was proclaimed in all of its truth. If we share the word without watering it down, that's when people are convicted by the Holy Spirit and they change their lives when they see sin, when they see the consequences of those sins, that they begin to change their lives. Well, let's call sin for what a sin is, but I'll tell you what. It's only when we realize the seriousness of sin that we can fully appreciate the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You know, it's, it's incredible. The gospel message, which means good news, is open to everyone. Christ came and he died on the cross for our sins. And it doesn't mean a whole lot to you unless you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When we put our trust in Christ, he changes us. When we put our trust in Christ, he forgives us. He cleanses us of our, of our sin. He gives us new life in him. But the incredible thing is, is we were still sinners. Well, we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And by doing that, he took our place by bearing the full wrath of God. Well, 
People had accused God of, of being the one who caused evil, and this is what James is talking about here. But as we go into verse 16, it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Look back at verse 13. Verse 13 says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. So now we come around to verse 16. And it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved. God's not the one who is tempting. But verse 17 ties directly to this. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. This whole concept here, the, the, the Father of lights, it was a, a title that was given by the Jews in regards to, to God as the creator. You see, uh, he was the creator of, of the universe, and here it's talking physically, you're talking the sun, you're talking the moon, you're talking the, the stars here. But the point here is God's not the author of temptation. God is the author of every good and perfect gift He's the father of lights. In fact, the NIV translates that, father of heavenly lights. And so we see these pictures of, of, of the, the, the sun and the moon and the stars. But in scripture, evil is so often represented by darkness. And so God is represented by light. Remember John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made and without him was nothing Without him, nothing has been made that was made. In him, in Jesus, was the light of men. You know, and the light came into the darkness and that whole imagery that's going on. And we find that God is always portrayed as light. Now, if the lights were turned off in here, it would be dark. You wouldn't see a whole lot of anything. If the lights were turned back on in here, all of a sudden, you can see. And that's the imagery with God. We want to be open. We want to be honest. You can see, but with darkness, the things of evil are done behind the scenes so that people can't even see. You know, God's represented in the Bible by light, but evil is represented by darkness and, and by shadows. But it says with God, there's no variation or shadow of turning. It's interesting, I was thinking about that, you know, because you talk about the shadows, and we know that if you go out at noon, you're not going to have a whole lot of shadows, but you go later in the day and you see those shadows casting, always shifting. The amazing thing to me is I feel like I'm standing still. I don't know about you guys. I don't know if you feel like you're flying all over the place. I feel like I'm standing still right now. But you realize that the earth is rotating at 1,070 miles, er, miles per hour. We're spinning that quickly right now in a circle. But we live in, in the midst of, of a massive galaxy called the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy has hundreds of millions of stars out there. And you realize that the Milky Way galaxy, which means us, are moving at 1.34 million miles per hour. So we're flying along 1.3 point uh, million miles an hour, and we're spinning at 1,070 miles per hour as well. I don't even feel like I'm moving. I don't know about you. Sometimes I get a little dizzy, but uh, <laughs> I don't know about you. But we get these shadows out there, and that's kind of the imagery is that as the dark shadows end up coming in, there's no variation and there's no, no turning with God because God never changes. Isn't that great news? I mean, everything around us seems to be changing but the, the Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When I moved 16 years ago, uh, I've had the opportunity to go back because that's where I'm originally from, uh, my hometown in, in Hayward, California. And I go back to where I used to live. And it's amazing because I walk around and there's hardly anyone there that I know anymore. Businesses have changed, the people have changed, the longtime neighbors have died or moved out of the area, and everything is changing. Drives you nuts. You look at ourselves, we're all changing. You don't see somebody for a few years, and we got a little more gray hair, and we got a little bigger stomach, we got little things as we get together. There's constant change that's going on. But when it comes to God, we're mutable beings, but when it comes to God, He never changes. Because one of the greatest attributes of God is that he is immutable. He does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever you're going through in your life, you can stand on the rock and know that God is a rock. And what he said in the word is still the same today. The method may change, but the message never does. It's interesting that in, in our day and age, uh, Jesus Christ here is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But look at the latter part here in verse 9. Do not be carried away by various doctrines, by various and strange doctrines. 
You know, today people are changing the word. They're changing in so many different ways. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, where God is the father of lights in the sense of physical lights, though, to realize that God is also the father of lights in the sense of spiritual light, that that salvation comes in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the light of the world. Verse 18, of his will, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of, of his creatures. This is talking about regeneration. It's talking about the need of being born again. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's a gift from God. Every good and perfect gift from God it comes from God. The ultimate gift from God is eternal life received only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And then James goes and he talks about the first fruits, and it says that we might be a kind of first fruits of his, of his creatures. In other words, the first fruits refers to the, the first of the harvest. In fact, the giving of the first fruits in the Old Testament was an act of faith by the giver. The very first crops that come up, well, I may not get any more crops. Or how about if you have weather changes that wipe out the crops that you have? The giver of the first cr fruits would take that first crop and they would offer it to God in belief, in trust, that God will fulfill the promises that he promised to do and bring the rest. Well, here James is referring to the persecuted believer, uh, the uh, diaspora, or in other words, the dispersion. Well, what kind of trials are you facing in your life today? Do you realize that through those trials that God is creating a masterpiece in you? I bought a, a new devotional by Billy Graham. It is really good. In fact, it's called Hope for Each Day. And November 19th in the morning, the scripture that was quoted was, if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. And this is what Billy writes. He says, all the masterpieces of painting contain both light and shadow. Artists use light and shadow to highlight every fe uh, certain features of their, of their subjects. They provide contrast and harmony to reveal beauty and character. A happy life is not one filled with sunshine, but one wh which both light and shadow produce beauty. Suffering or persecution can become a blessing because they can, be a, they can form a backdrop for the radiance of the Christian life. The greatest musicians, as a rule, are those who know how to bring songs out of sadness. Fanny Crosby, her spirit aglow with faith in Christ, saw more with her sightless eyes than most of us see with normal vision. She gave us some great gospel songs and cheer our hearts and lives. Paul and Silas sang a song of praise at midnight in a rat-infested jail in Philippi. Their feet in stocks, their backs raw from the jailer's whip. But their patience and suffering and persecution led to the conversion of a heathen prison warden and his family. Don't despise the shadows that God brings or he allows in your life. He can use them to produce a masterpiece. What are you struggling with today? What kind of temptations have you been fighting? How is your walk in your love for Christ? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for each and every person who's here today. And one thing that all of us have in common is that we're all struggling with trials. We're all struggling with temptations. Lord, we're all sinners who, who need that salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. Lord, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know Christ and they would like to get right before, before that time comes, we saw life is short. Lord, I pray that they would just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and life and help me, Lord, to be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. Lord, I give my life to you this day and, 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 and worship you. And then, Lord, maybe there's people out here who are struggling with sin and, or struggling in an area of their life where they just need prayer today. And I pray that if there are, that maybe they would come up after the service and we can just pray together over something here. And um, Lord, that this would be the first day of the rest of our lives. So Lord, we praise you and we love you. We thank you for the example that Jesus gave of using scripture to defeat the attacks of the enemy. And Lord, I pray that our lives would reflect the love and the glory of God to others. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.